Camels are a well-known group of ungulates that are widespread throughout the world and have become a staple part of our lives throughout our time here. Be it for food, transportation, or other means, the history of mankind is a history that has always had a strong association with these animals. Camels are part of a family known as Camelidae, a family that includes dromedary and Bactrian camels, as well as South American animals such as llamas and alpacas. The domestication of these various species has led to their incredible numbers, but relative to other groups of hoofed mammals, the Camelidae family is actually quite small with only 6 to 7 unique members. Despite this, camels have had a long and storied legacy of evolution that dates back to the early Cenozoic. Camelidae itself belongs to an order of animals known as Tylopata. Though it is originally believed that this group was closely related to ungulates such as ruminants, it's now generally accepted that these animals are more distantly related to any other artiodactyls, even non-ruminants like pigs, hippos, and whales. As a result, it's believed that it is the tylopods that were the first to split off from the artiodactyl family tree when they first appeared in the fossil record during the early Eocene. Tylopoda is a group which contains numerous different families of animals, such as the llama-like members of Xiphodontidae or the Oreodonts, which itself was home to an incredible diversity of herbivore body plants. By far the most closely related family in Tylopoda to the camels were the Oromericidae, who alongside the group containing camels formed the superfamily Cameloidea. Oromericid shared many physical similarities to true camels, such as sporting high-crowned teeth. In fact, an Oromericid from the early Eocene, Protylopus, used to be classified as one of the earliest camel genera. While it's no longer seen as a proper member of Camelidae, it strongly resembles basal members of the family. What were the very earliest camels has been a subject of scientific debate for a while, mainly due to the aforementioned similarities between true camelids and the camel lookalikes of related families like Oromericidae. However, a strong contender for a basal camelid can be found in the North American genus Pelbridon of the early Middle Eocene. This animal has sparse fossil evidence, but what does exist sheds light on its relationship to other camels. In addition to having high crowned teeth, it also had a bony chamber around its ear, a chamber that wasn't present in any other artiodactyl group except for the one containing camels. Towards the tail end of the Eocene, new camels began to evolve, such as the three foot tall Pobrotherium of North America. Pobrotherium looked like a cross between a llama and a small antelope, and while this animal was indeed a camel, the structure of its limbs belied a very uncamel like pattern of behavior. Its long legs were built for a lifestyle of running on plains, and unlike modern camels which are known for walking on padded toes, Pobrotherium walked on sharp hooves very similar to animals such as deer. As the earth cooled during the transition from the Eocene to the Oligocene, it brought about the catalyst for a change in the still young Camelidae. Following Pobrotherium, Camelidae began to see an incredible explosion in diversity, with many different lines emerging after the start of the Oligocene. These lines grew in size during this epoch, and the rate of expansion was only further bolstered by the spread of grasslands throughout the earth for the next several million years. Among these new camel groups were the Senomylines. These camels differed from their sister groups in that they strongly resembled gazelles, even more so than earlier members like Pobrotherium. They also had molars that are so high crowned that their roots went all the way to the bottom of their jaws. Similar to other animals today like cows and horses, these types of high crowned or hypsodon teeth would be extremely useful for the wear caused by constant grazing. One of the earliest known stenomylines is Paratylopus which is found throughout the western half of the US during the Oligocene. Stenomylus was another member of the group that lived around the same time frame and it had a strong resemblance in morphology to the Geronuk, mainly due to their similar long necks and gazelle-like bodies. Geronuks today are known as browsers, and their lengthened neck helps them reach for higher vegetation. It's not known for sure whether or not Stenomylus was also a browser, but given that its teeth were extremely high crowned like with other members in its group as well as the nature of its habitat, it's likely that it is primarily a grazer. That being said, modern camels are both browsers and grazers, so a browsing lifestyle could still be possible for the animal. Florida Tregulinae contains some of the most bizarre looking of all camels. These camels are strictly located in regions of Southern America and Central America such as, as their group name gives away, Florida. Florida Tragulines such as the Miocene Florida Tragulus are best known for having extremely odd looking snouts. Their muzzles were rather flat and extremely long. In addition to this, animals such as Florida Tragulus could use them to deliver powerful bites. Myolabinae was another group that was prominent during the Miocene and contained animals such as Myolabis found in the United States and Canada. Myolabines such as Myolabis are known for having shorter legs as well as teeth that were not as high crowned as in other camels. Members of Protilabinae on the other hand were known to have evolved a more antelope-like appearance where they had longer legs and longer snouts. 
Their snouts didn't reach the length of Florida tragulines, but their proportions were longer than other early camelids such as the slender gazelle-like stenomylines. This group includes animals such as Protolavis that lived throughout the Miocene, where it could be found from Midwestern United States all the way to South and Central American countries like Nicaragua. The AP camelines, which some sources also refer to as the oxydactylines, are probably my favorite of all the camels we'll mention today. These camels are known for having extremely long necks and legs, making them converge on the body plans of giraffes. The earliest member of this family is known as Oxydactylus. The best known of these camels is AP camelus, which could be found throughout the United States during the Miocene. This animal measured 13 feet at the shoulder, and with its neck clocking in at another 6 feet, this animal's total height would have had it rivaling modern giraffes, making it one of the tallest mammals to have ever lived. These giraffe camels would typically be found on the drier grasslands where many of the Miocene camelids lived, but given their sheer difference in height from their contemporaries, they'd have access to food sources no other mammal would be able to get to. The AP camelines alongside other camel groups worked in part with many other ungulates from Miocene North America to provide a savanna ecosystem that neatly paralleled that of the African plains that we're so familiar with today. With camels filling in the roles of giraffes and antelopes, the aminodont rhinos taking on the roles of hippos, gomphotheres as elephants, and horses acting as zebras, it was North America where we really got our first true glimpse of this sort of grassland ecosystem. However, Disaster struck Camelidae at the end of the Miocene. Just as the change in climate from the Eocene to the Oligocene allowed the camels to expand, another global cooling that occurred between the Miocene and the Pliocene wiped out many of these unique camel groups. Gone would be the gazelle, antelope, and giraffe-like camels which would not be able to adapt to the drier environments that the Pliocene brought upon North America. Under these conditions, only two groups of camels were able to survive. These were the Lamini and the Camelini. The Lamini first emerged during the Middle Miocene, around 10 million years ago. As the name suggests, these camels included llamas and their close relatives. It also contained members that lasted far into the late Pleistocene, such as Hemia cani and Paleolama, which survived until 12 and 11,000 years ago, respectively. In looking at the broader sense of camelid evolution, I'd like to look closer into the former genus. Hemia cani evolved in the Middle Miocene, where the earliest species Hemia cania minima could be found in Florida. At first glance, it looked just like today's modern llamas, albeit larger in size. What's notable about this genus, however, is that it was among the first camelids to migrate to South America when the two continents connected to each other during the Pliocene. Hemiocania fossils are found today all over South America, and it's likely that this genus was the one that brought about the modern South American camelids. These include the guanaco and vicuña, which gave rise to their domesticated descendants, the llama and the alpaca. These animals aren't typically referred to as camels in the public sense, but they represent what an average camel would have looked like not only during the Pleistocene in the Americas, but millions of years ago as well. While we associate camels today as being humped desert-dwelling creatures, in reality many of the camels we've discussed so far look more similar to llamas or alpacas rather than the camels of Africa and Asia. To dig into those types of camels, we'll have to look into the second branch of modern camelids, the camelini. Unlike the Lamini, these camels were not known to have migrated to South America save for the genus Eulamaops of the Pleistocene. Rather, these camels persisted in North America where some members later migrated into Eurasia through the Bering Strait. Camelini was a widespread group that included all kinds of unique forms of camels. Some of these include the giant mega camels such as Megatylopus, Titanotylopus, and Megacamelus. But the only old world genus of Camelidae alive today is Camelus. Camelus is a genus whose members are all known for generally inhabiting dry desert habitats, but its ancestors may have lived in the farthest things from those habitats. The most commonly believed ancestor of Camelus was the Miocene genus Paracamelus. This animal is found throughout North America and Eurasia, having crossed the Bering Land Bridge during its existence. Interestingly enough, it's believed that Paracamelus lived in colder boreal forests near the Arctic. Some evidence supporting this could be found in its cheek teeth, which are lower than in other camelids. This could have indicated a browsing diet, which would have been the norm in a more forested environment such as the one that Paracamelus was thought to have lived in. The cheek teeth of modern camels are also similarly low crowned, so they were thought to have been derived from Paracamelus. Paracamelus led to the genus Camelus, which includes an assortment of different camel species. These include the high arctic camels that are known to have inhabited relatively cold regions in North America. In addition, Paracamelus was also stated to have evolved into the Syrian camel, Camelus morelli, which is estimated by some to have been the largest camel that ever lived. Of course we need to mention the fact that Camelus is the genus that contains our modern old world camels, the one hump dromedary camel and the two hump bactrian camel. Some also argue that there exists a third species within Camelus, the wild Bactrian camel, which is taxonomically distinct enough from its domesticated cousin to warrant its own classification as Camelus ferris. 
The Bactrian camel is argued by scientists to have evolved first around 2 million years ago in Central Asia, where the dromedary camel evolved from the Bactrian camel or a very close relative in Western Asia. The evidence supporting this comes from the fact that dromedary camel fetuses contain two humps and that adult males also have a vestigial hump. It should be noted that the dromedary camel and Bactrian camel are purely domesticated species, with all wild dromedary camels having gone extinct for 2,000 years. The only wild camel that exists today is the wild Bactrian camel, which is currently critically endangered. Before ending this discussion on camel evolution, I should probably touch up on where their humps came from. There are a few different theories as to where they emerged. Humps have typically only been found in the camels of Camelini, a trait that also helps set them apart from other camelid groups. In some members, such as the North American genus Camelops, the raised structure of their vertebrae gives potential evidence of them having had humps. However, it's unknown if this is a true camel hump or if it is just a raised part of their upper body, similar to the humps of other ungulates. Another line of research postulates that humps are a derived trait from Paracamelus itself, specifically as an adaptation for living in northern regions surrounding Beringia. The fatty humps could have served Paracamelus during cold winter droughts just as it helped desert-dwelling camels in their own environment. It's definitely funny to think that the most iconic feature of camels, a staple desert animal, was an adaptation for cold weather environments. The evolution of camels is a story of great diversification and tragic extinctions that led to the survival of those animals that are the hardiest. Today, the dromedary and Bactrian camels as well as the llamas and alpacas are in high numbers thanks to their domestication. Likewise, the guanaco and vicuña, the wild ancestors to South American camelids, are also listed under least concern and aren't currently threatened in any major way. The same can't be said, however, for the wild Bactrian camel, which is currently a critically endangered species. The main threats to this animal come in the form of poaching for their meat, as well as a more interesting concern in which domesticated Bactrian camels breed with wild ones, leading to a reduction in genetically distinct wild camels. Many conservation groups in regions where this animal can be found, such as in China and Mongolia, have been working to bring this animal back from the brink, taking measures such as having captive breeding programs. Whatever the future for these wild camels may hold, it's undeniable that they and all Camelidae of today represent an ancient lineage that managed to survive and hold on throughout the Cenozoic.